Welcome to the History AI Podcast, where the past comes alive with facts, anecdotes, and a dash of humor. Here are your hosts, Chuck and Marco. Welcome to the History AI Podcast. I'm your host, Chuck, joined by the ever-curious Marco. Today, we're delving into the Battle of Fulford, a crucial but often overlooked moment in history. But first, let's set the scene. The year is 1066. Ah, 1066? Not just any year, Chuck. A year that's going to be seared into the annals of history, a real game-changer for England and, frankly, for all of Europe. Right you are, Marco. But to understand Fulford, we need to look at what was happening around this time. England was a land in transition. Edward the Confessor, the King of England, had died in January, leaving a power vacuum. And you know what they say about power vacuums, Chuck. They don't stay vacant for long. There were several claimants to the throne, each with their own unique backing and claim. Absolutely, Marco. There's Harold Godwin's son, crowned King of England just after Edward's death. But his claim was soon challenged. And not just by anyone, Chuck. We're talking about some heavy hitters here. First, there's William, Duke of Normandy, claiming that Edward promised him the throne. And then there's our man for today's episode, King Harold Hardrada of Norway. Known as one of the last great Viking leaders, Harold believed he had a claim through an agreement with the previous Danish king of England, Knut the Great. This sets up a stage for a three-way power struggle. England at this time was a prize worth fighting for, wealthy, fertile, with strong trade networks. And let's not forget Marco, the Viking raids and settlements had already left a significant imprint on northern England. York was a major Viking hub. The influence was tangible in the culture, language, and even in the genetics of the people. Right, and this cultural blend sets the stage for our battle. The English weren't just facing a foreign invader, they were up against a force that was part of their own historical fabric. And speaking of fabric, let's talk about the world stage. Europe is in a period of transformation. The old Viking age is winding down, and new nation-states are emerging. And with new states come new ambitions, new conflicts. Europe is a chessboard, and England is a crucial piece. Exactly. So, on one hand, we have Harold Godwin's son trying to secure his reign, dealing with internal politics and external threats. On the other, Harold Hardrada, eyeing England as the crowning achievement of his career. And don't forget William of Normandy, biding his time across the Channel. It's like a historical drama, but with real stakes, kingdoms, lives, the future of a nation. Perfectly put, Marco. And this, dear listeners, is the world into which the Battle of Fulford steps. A clash not just of armies, but of ambitions, claims, and visions for the future of England. Now, let's dive into the nitty-gritty of the planning and preparation. Right, Marco. The planning of the Battle of Fulford is a tale of strategy, ambition, and a bit of old-fashioned Viking audacity. It's the autumn of 1066, and King Harald Hardrada of Norway sets his eyes on England. And he wasn't coming for a friendly visit, was he Chuck? Harald, known for his experience and military prowess, aimed to conquer. But he needed a plan. Exactly. His plan? A classic Viking strategy, a surprise attack. Harold's fleet, rumored to be around 300 ships, set sail towards England, carrying thousands of warriors. A massive force, Chuck! Meanwhile, in England, the newly crowned King Harold Godwin's son is dealing with threats from all sides. He's got his eyes on the south, expecting William of Normandy to invade. Which is what makes Harold's plan so cunning. He chooses to strike in the north, aiming for York, a rich and strategic prize. The element of surprise was on his side. But he wasn't alone, Chuck. He allied with toasted Godwin's son, King Harold's estranged brother, adding a personal twist to this invasion. Ah, family drama Marco. It never fails to spice things up. Tostig, harboring a grudge against his brother, brings local knowledge and additional forces to Harold's already formidable army. On the English side, the defense of the north was led by Earls Edwin and Morcar. Young, but not inexperienced, they were tasked with defending their lands against this massive Viking force. And here's where the tactics come in. Harold knew the English forces were spread thin, dealing with multiple threats. His plan? Strike quickly, strike hard, and take York before Harold Godwin's son could even react. 
but it wasn't just brute force Chuck. The Vikings were skilled in warfare. They understood the importance of terrain, speed, and shock value. Absolutely Marco. The Vikings landed at Ritkal, a few miles south of York. This location gave them a strategic advantage, it was close enough for a swift attack, yet far enough to avoid immediate detection. And what about the English Earls Chuck? They had to muster their forces quickly, gather their local feared, which were essentially militia, and prepare to face a seasoned, professional Viking army. A daunting task Marco. They had to plan not just for battle, but for the defense of their lands, their people. The morale of their troops, the loyalty of their subjects, everything was at stake. And let's not forget Chuck, this was more than a military operation. It was a statement. Both sides wanted to show their strength, their right to rule, their destiny to lead. Now, let's dive into the heart of the action, the battle itself. That's right Chuck. September 20th, 1066, a pivotal day. The stage is set near the village of Fulford, close to York. It's here that Harold Hardrada and toasted Godwin's son face off against the English forces led by Earls Edwin and Morcar. The setting is crucial. The battlefield lies next to the River Ouse, with the marshy land of the Ings to one side. This terrain plays a significant role in the battle's dynamics. Terrain always does chuck. The Vikings, known for their adaptability, positioned themselves cleverly. They used the river and marshes to limit the movement of the English forces. And let's talk about numbers. The Viking army, possibly around 10,000 strong, faced a similar number of English troops. But it's not just about numbers, it's about experience, strategy, and morale. The English earls, aware of the Viking position, decided to launch a direct attack. Their plan was to break through the Viking lines before they could fully assemble. A bold move Marco. The English forces charged, and for a moment, it looked like they might have the upper hand. They pushed the Viking left flank back towards the marshes. But here's where Hardrada's experience shines through. He had kept a reserve force. Seeing his left flank wavering, he sends in this reserve to bolster the line. A crucial moment Marco. The tide of the battle begins to turn. Hardrada's counterattack pushes the English back. The fighting is fierce, brutal, and the skills of the Viking warriors start to tell. And let's not forget the psychological aspect. The sight of Hardrada, a giant of a man by all accounts, fighting in the front lines, must have been both inspiring for the Vikings and terrifying for the English. Absolutely. Meanwhile, the English are fighting not just for victory, but for survival. They're on their own turf, defending their homes, their families. But the Vikings, with their battle-hardened warriors and strategic acumen, continue to press their advantage. The English find themselves squeezed between the Viking forces and the marshy ground. A classic pincer movement Marco. The English are trapped. Casualties mount, and the situation becomes desperate. In the chaos, heroes emerge on both sides. Stories of individual bravery, of warriors fighting to their last breath, of moments of extraordinary valor. But despite their courage, the English forces are overwhelmed. The Vikings secure a decisive victory. York, a key strategic and symbolic prize, falls into Viking hands. A devastating loss for the English. But the story doesn't end here. This battle sets the stage for what's to come, the Battle of Stamford Bridge. We've covered the fierce Battle of Fulford, and now, we turn to its aftermath and the broader impact. Indeed Marco. The aftermath of Fulford was a turning point. Following their victory, the Vikings moved to occupy York. This wasn't just a military conquest, it was a statement of power. Absolutely. York's capitulation was significant. Remember, York was a former Viking stronghold, a city with deep historical and cultural ties to the Norse. And let's talk about the English side. The defeat at Fulford was a heavy blow. Earls Edwin and Morcar, though they escaped, had suffered significant losses. This weakened the English defense in the north dramatically. But Chuck, the story doesn't pause there. King Harold Godwin's son, down in the south, had to make a crucial decision. With the threat of William of Normandy looming, he had to choose where to focus his efforts. Right Marco, Harold makes a bold choice. He decides to march north at remarkable speed, gathering forces as he goes. This rapid response is a testament to his leadership and the loyalty he commanded. 
Now, turning back to Harold Hardrada, the victory at Fulford emboldens him. He perhaps underestimates the speed and resolve of Harold Gardwinson's response. A critical point Marco Hardrada, expecting some respite, plans to gather more hostages and supplies at Stamford Bridge. But what he doesn't expect is Harold Godwinson's army, ready for battle. And that leads us to another epic confrontation, but we'll get to that in our next episode. For now, let's focus on the broader impact of Fulford. The battle shows the vulnerability of England to external threats and internal divisions. Absolutely. It's a wake-up call, not just for the English, but for all of Europe. The Viking Age is drawing to a close, but its final chapters are as dramatic as any that came before. The Battle of Fulford also demonstrates the changing nature of warfare. The coordination, speed, and tactics used by both the Vikings and the English would influence military strategies for generations. And let's not forget the human cost Marco. The casualties were high on both sides. Families lost fathers, sons, brothers. The landscape of northern England was altered, both physically and in the hearts and minds of its people. In the grand scheme, Fulford sets in motion a series of events that reshape England. It's a prelude to the end of Anglo-Saxon rule and the dawn of a new era under Norman influence. That's right, Marco. The events of 1066, starting with Fulford, signal the end of one era and the birth of another. England would never be the same again. Now let's dive into the legacy of the Battle of Fulford. Fulford might not be as famous as the battles that followed, but its legacy is deeply interwoven into the fabric of medieval history. You're spot on, Marco. The Battle of Fulford marks the beginning of a series of events that radically altered the course of English history. It's the opening act of a drama that concludes with the Norman conquest of England. That's right. Fulford set in motion the wheels that led to the end of the Anglo-Saxon era in England. It was a catalyst for the seismic changes that followed. Let's talk about the Viking legacy. Fulford was one of the last great Viking battles in England. It showcased the Vikings' military prowess, their strategic acumen, and their fearless approach to warfare. Indeed, Chuck. And it reminds us of the impact the Norse had on England, culturally, linguistically, and even genetically. The Vikings left an indelible mark, and Fulford is a stark reminder of their influence. On the flip side, the battle highlighted the vulnerabilities and the resilience of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. The rapid response by Harold Godwin's son after Fulford, his march north to Stamford Bridge, speaks volumes about the English leadership and military capabilities of the time. Absolutely, Chuck. It also underscores the fluidity of alliances and the complexities of medieval politics. Tostig's alliance with Harold Hardrada, against his own brother, adds a Shakespearean twist to the whole affair. And let's not overlook the human aspect. The stories of bravery, sacrifice, and tragedy that emerged from Fulford resonate through history. They remind us of the human cost of war, the lives impacted, the futures altered. The battle also serves as a lesson in the importance of strategic planning and reconnaissance. Hardrada's initial success at Fulford, followed by his eventual defeat at Stamford Bridge, is a classic study in military strategy. In the broader scope of medieval history, Fulford exemplifies the era's warfare, the clash of cultures, and the shifting power dynamics. It's a microcosm of a period marked by conquest, transition, and the evolution of kingdoms. So, while Fulford may not be as celebrated as Hastings or Stamford Bridge, its legacy is equally significant. It's a pivotal chapter in the story of England, a moment that helped shape the nation's future. Well said, Marco. And that brings us to the end of today's episode on the Battle of Fulford. We hope you've enjoyed this journey through history with us. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and share our podcast. And if you have any historical battles or events you'd like us to explore, reach out to us on social media. Until next time, keep delving into the past and uncovering the stories that shaped our world. This is Chuck and Marco signing off from the History AI podcast. From the mind behind the History AI podcast comes an electrifying journey into the past. A ripple through time, Franklin's folly. Dive into a tale where Benjamin Franklin, America's beloved inventor, takes an unexpected journey through time. But with his leap, he unleashes a powerful ripple.
Now, with dark forces lurking in the shadows, harnessing this energy to shatter and enslave the world, it's a race against time. Will Franklin fix the future? Or will history rewrite itself? Uncover the secrets. A ripple through time, Franklin's folly. Time has never been more fragile. On Amazon now.